still and is soon going to be moving to the University of Bath for a postdoc. Um, and this is the archive reference for, for this paper. So the basic model that I want to consider is that of a random graph with given degrees. So I'm going to think about a graph GN, which is chosen uniformly at random from those whose vertex is, vertices are labeled by the, uh, the numbers one up to N and vertex I is going to have degree or number of neighbors given by some quantity DI. And there's a standard method for generating uh, a multi-graph on n vertices with these given degrees d1 up to dn, and this is called the configuration model. Um, so this is due in varying degrees of generality, sort of to ideas from Bender and Canfield, Bolabash and Warwald, and then a whole sequence of people subsequent to that. So I'm going to assume for simplicity that all of my degrees are at least one. It's easy to see what to do if you have vertices of degree zero because they just end up floating around and not attaching to anything. So let's assume for simplicity that we have all of them being at least one. And let's assume also that the sum of the degrees is even. That's clearly going to be a necessary condition for us to be able to build a graph. So I'm going to assign di half edges or stubs, we sometimes call them, to the vertex labeled i. And then I'm going to number the stubs in an arbitrary way from one up to ln. And then I'm going to generate a random pairing of the half edges. And I'm going to take that pairing uniformly around. So here's a sort of quick example. Here I've got vertices labeled one up to five. Um, these are the little stubs. So these are half edges that are attached to each of those vertices. And I'm going to pick first uh, a sort of arbitrary labeling, and then I'm going to use that to generate my uniformly random matching here. And if I match up half edges to produce full edges, what that gives me is the graph on the right-hand side, as I hope it's sort of reasonably easy to see. Okay. So of course, this procedure can very easily give rise to loops or multiple edges. Let me just show you how that can happen. So if, for example, this half edge had decided to connect to this one, which is perfectly proper, possible with a, a uniform matching, then I would have created a loop on the vertex labeled one. And similarly, if I happen to have connected, so this one to there and that one to there, then I would have got a pair of sort of parallel edges between the same pair of vertices. So, in general, we certainly get a multigraph, but if on the other hand, we condition the object that we get to have no loops and no multiple edges, so in other words, to be simple, then it turns out that it's uniformly chosen from the set of graphs with those given degrees. Okay, so with that extra step of conditioning, this is generating the object that we're interested in. So I want to add an extra layer of randomness. So what I'd like to do is now take the degrees, d1 up to dn, to be random variables. Uh, I'm going to take them to be IID um, with finite variance, and a key role is going to be played by the parameter gamma, which is given by this ratio of moments of D. So this is the expectation of D times D minus one divided by the expectation of D. So of course, if I take random degrees, it may be that the sum of those degrees is odd, in which case in general, we're not going to be able to use these degrees in order to make a graph. And I'm just going to deal with that or rather push it under the carpet by doing my matching edge by edge. And if at the end, I've got a half edge left over, I'm just going to ignore it, okay? And so this gives us in general, a random multigraph MN, okay? So if you do this with the IID degrees um, and suppose that you have finite finite variance and so in particular this parameter gamma is some finite quantity, then it turns out that the probability of the multigraph that I generate is simple converges as n goes to infinity to this quantity here. And the key point here is that this quantity is strictly positive. So I have strictly positive probability of generating a simple graph and so in particular when I do my conditioning that's a, a, a legitimate thing to do. Okay. So something I just sort of made reference to which is actually an important point which is that I can generate my uniform matching of half edges edge by edge in any order that's convenient to me. And in particular, it's going to be a kind of key part of this talk that I'm going to think about exploring my graph sort of vertex by vertex. And in particular, I can actually sample the graph as I explore it. And that's going to be very useful to me. So I can in fact generate the graph and the exploration of the graph sort of step by step. So, um, one of the most important questions that one might want to answer about this graph model is, does it possess a giant component? So is there a macroscopic proportion of the vertices all of which are connected to one another in a connected component, or are the connected components only small? So let me just remind you of my parameter gamma. 
So gamma is important because it provides the critical point for the emergence of a giant component. So in particular, if gamma is less than or equal to one, the largest component is microscopic in size. So it contains a vanishing proportion of the vertices in the graph. Whereas if gamma is bigger than one, the largest component contains a strictly positive proportion of the vertices. And then all of the other graph components are tiny by comparison. They're all little over there. Okay. So I should have said that this is a result which is due to Malloy and Reed in 1995. Um, and as is sort of typical in these circumstances, the most delicate behavior is actually occurring at the point of this phase transition. So at gamma equals one. And that's going to be the focus uh, of this project. Okay, so what I'd like to do is give you an idea of why gamma equals one is the key point uh, in, this, in this object. So for intuition's purposes, so let's imagine exploring the graph starting from some arbitrarily chosen vertex. So I've got a vertex labeled one, we may as well start there. So think about where that vertex is connected to. So it has a certain number of half edges and those half edges, let's look at just one of them, it's going to be connected to a vertex which is chosen with probability proportional to its degree. Okay, my half edge is going to connect somewhere uniformly among the half edges that are available. And so I'm more likely to pick a half edge which is connected to a vertex which has more half edges itself. Okay, and this is true whenever I look to connect to another half edge. I look among the vertices available and I pick one with probability proportional to its available half edges. So, Assuming that I've only looked at a small number of vertices, that means that the chosen degree that I pick should have a law which is close to the size bias distribution, right? So rather than seeing a typical vertex degree, I'm gonna see a size biased vertex degree. Okay, so let's call D star the size biased version of the random variable D. So that has this probability mass function. And the intuition is that as I explore, Locally, what I'm going to see is something like a gault motts and branching process, whose offspring distribution is approximately the law of d star minus one. So why d star minus one? So my half edge connects into a half edge of a, a size biased random vertex, and the half edge on the way in uses up one of the degrees. And then, if you like, the offspring of that vertex are going to be the remaining degrees. Okay, so that gives me a d star minus one. And of course, the expectation of d star minus one, I can just calculate in terms of the moments of d, and that gives me precisely gamma. So the intuition here is then that the branching process becomes extinct with probability one if gamma is at most one, and has positive probability of survival if gamma is bigger than one. So obviously this analogy between branching process and graph isn't going to hold sort of all the way out, but it holds far enough that essentially the branching process surviving corresponds to the possibility of creating a giant component. Okay, so that's why, that's where gamma equals one comes up as the critical point for this phase transition. So I said I was going to look at the point of the phase transition. So let me specify slightly more precisely uh, the situation I'm going to be interested in. So I've got IID random degrees D1 up to DN, which have law nu which is such that the following things hold. So I've got that each of them is at least one with probability one. I tune things so that I've got that this gamma parameter is precisely equal to one. And I'm going to choose it so that the probability mass function of my degree distribution has a power law tail behavior like this. So I've got some constant C and some fixed alpha between one and two, such that the tail probability I'm oh, sorry, the, the probability mass function looks like k to the minus alpha plus two. And this alpha between one and two should hopefully be suggestive of stable laws, and that's going to come up later in the talk. Okay, so let me also write mu for the mean of uh, this random variable d1. And in fact, it's a consequence of these conditions that mu is between one and two, but that's not particularly important. So this is a setup that was first considered by Adrien Joseph in a, a very lovely paper in 2014 in Annals of Applied Probability. Um, and some of what I'm going to talk to you about today is a reproof of some of Adrien's results. So let me again write MN for a random multigraph, which is generated according to the configuration model with these IID random degrees. And let's write GN for the version of MN, which is just conditioned to be simple. And it's going to turn out that it doesn't really matter which of those I look at. So as regards the, the scaling and limit results that I'm going to be interested in, it doesn't matter whether I look at the version condition to be a multigraph or 
sorry, the version which is a multi-graph or the version condition to be simple. Okay, so um, Delphine Senizanko is a, a co-author on the, the second paper that you will hear about today, um, made some very beautiful simulations of um, large components of these things. So this is what an alpha equals 1.8 component might look like. It's quite a sort of hairy object and you see it's got a cycle in here. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, going to decrease the value of alpha. And what you can see happens is that these things become wilder and wilder and wilder. So we're getting these extremely high degree vertices cropping up in these things. These things typically get called hubs, okay? So the sorts of limit object we're going to be looking at will in fact end up having vertices of infinite degree in them. So this is a sort of reflection of what's going to be heavy tailed behavior among the vertex degrees. Okay, so hopefully I will explain as we go where that arises. So my aim is to understand the fine structure of the graph at the critical point. So first in terms of its component sizes, and then in more detail, sort of its geometric properties, what a typical distance is like, can one describe the metric properties of these things? So there's a setting which is better understood, or at least which was understood earlier, which is where, so D1 has finite third moments. So let me just go back to the conditions that I imposed. So here you can see that with the probability mass function having this behavior, you don't have a finite third moment. You have a finite second moment, so we wanted a, a finite variance, but we don't have a finite third moment. If you do impose a finite third moment, then you end up in the same universality class as the critical erdos renyi random graph, so the simplest random graph model you could think of. Okay, so this is a, a nice pic picture that Nicolas Brutin drew of um, the critical erdos renyi random graph, where you can see the components sort of ordered by size from the middle going out to the, to the sides. Um, it's a sort of cockpit picture. Um, so uh, this has been studied by several authors, including Oliver Reard, and Adrien Joseph covers it also in his paper. And then there's a series of works, um, including one by Dara van der Hofstad van Leuven uh, in 2017, which study the configuration model with um, finite third moment for the degrees. So let me give you a, a brief sketch of what's the situation there. So the largest components in that situation have sizes on the order of n to the two thirds. And when rescaled, those sizes have limits of distribution. So this is a result that was first proved by Alders in 1997 for the odo schrenyi model, and which has been subsequently proved for a wide variety of different random graph families at their critical points. Okay. The large components are quite close to being trees in the sense that they have only order one more edges than a tree would have. And one can prove an exact scaling limit for the components if you think about each graph component as a metric space, and then, well, so you think about it as a metric space by taking the vertices being the points of your metric space and the distances being given by the graph distance. So in other words, the number of edges you need to traverse to get between a pair of vertices. And it turns out that you get a, a nice scaling limit if you rescale those distances by n to the minus one third. Okay, so this is something that uh, I did in joint work with Luigi Dariaveri and Nicola Brutan back in sort of 2010-ish for the odish Schrenyi model, which has been subsequently done by uh, a long string of authors um, for various other models. Um, so I'm very conscious that I'm not giving as full citations as I might hear. I would have a sort of list of pages of, of papers, but anybody who would like to have a sort of more detailed history of, of this model and of the related problems, please do let me know. I can happily point you in the right direction. Um, so the scaling limit of a large component of a critical Erdős Rényi graph, so this is another one of Nicola Bolton's uh, pictures, looks like a sort of much more well-behaved object than the sort of things we saw in Delphine's pictures just now. So here you can see that the vertex degrees are staying nice and bounded and things look pretty well behaved. I mean, okay, so this is supposed to look like a sort of random fractal object as it is, but on the other hand, it's quite a sort of tame one by comparison with the sorts of things we might be expecting in our heavy tailed setting. So what's the motivation for studying the power law setting? So this tail behavior that we've chosen sort of matches up with the sort of power law behavior that one might observe in many real world networks. So I don't want to make any grand claims about the usefulness of this model for, for actually modeling real world networks. It certainly doesn't have good clustering properties like you might want to have in a social network or something like that. So although this is a, a very idealized model, it's nonetheless interesting to see that we obtain a certain amount of universality. So my results are going to hold for anything in this class which has um, the right tail behavior. 
So in fact, the finite third moment case can be done in exactly the same way as I'm going to do for this sort of power law tail setting. Um, so let me just include it there here. And it's convenient to refer to it as the alpha equals two case. So the, the power law ones are going to be alpha between one and two and alpha equals two is going to be the, the finite third moment case. So let me start by talking about component sizes. So um, I'm going to be thinking about the ordered list of component sizes, either of the multigraph MN or of the simple graph GN. Doesn't matter which one you look at. It's going to be convenient for me to define L2 down arrow simply to be uh, the space of ordered sequences X1, X2. So in decreasing order, which is square summable. Okay, so then it turns out to be the case that if we take this list of ordered component sizes and we rescale by a factor of n to the minus alpha on alpha plus one, then we get in convergence of distribution to some limit sequence C um, in the L2 sets as n goes to infinity. And so this limit C can be described in terms of the lengths of the excursion above zero or excursions above zero of a certain stochastic process that I'm going to explain in a couple of slides time. Okay, so the first question I want to answer is how does one encode the component sizes in a useful way so that we can get hold of them and prove such a convergence in distribution? And there's a by now sort of fairly standard route to such uh, results, which go via a sort of careful Markovian exploration of the graph. So I'm going to think about sampling the degrees d1 up to dn and thinking of them as fixed. And then I'm going to start from a vertex v0, which could be arbitrary, but it's going to be helpful if I choose it with probability proportional to its degree. And I'm going to then declare the smallest labeled of its half edges to be active. And I'm going to put the rest of its half edges on a stack to be considered later. Smallest label closest to the top. And I'm now going to sample the active half edges pair. So that is either belonging to a vertex I haven't seen before, or it's belonging to something which I have seen. It could be on the stack. And I connect them up and I remove both from consideration. If I discovered a new vertex, I'm going to add its remaining half edges to the top of the stack and then declare whichever half edges on top of the stack to be a new active half edge. And if ever this stack becomes empty, I'm just going to pick a new vertex again with probability proportional to its degree, put all of its half edges onto the stack, declare the top one to be the active half edge and continue. So let me give you an example because I think that will be easier to understand. So these are my vertex degrees represented as little stubs. Okay, I'm going to start from zero, which I should take as a sort of an indication that I should start a new component. So Rn here is going to be the size of the stack. Okay, so I pick one of these with probability proportional to its size, suppose this one. Okay, and I'm going to put its half edges on a stack. So the half edges are here indicated by these boxes. Okay, so this is a vertex and these are half edges. So I've got three things on the stack. I take the lowest labeled, which I happen to have drawn at the top here, and make that the active half edge. So it's going to select its pair uniformly from those available. So that could either be on the stack or belonging to a vertex we haven't yet seen. And suppose it belongs to this vertex here. So then I connect these two things up and I make this half edge the new active one. Okay, so I've now got three things on the stack, the active half edge, and the two that I had before. And I'm going in a depth first manner. So things that I've discovered more recently, I'm going to explore sooner. So I've currently got three things on the stack. So the value of my process is three. Okay, again, I'm going to pick uniformly at random a half edge, and that happens to be on the stack this time. So I'm going to make this connection here. And obviously I contract to give an edge. So now I've only got one thing left on the stack that becomes the new active half edge. It picks its pair and we proceed. So we now have nothing on the stack. There's nothing that we've seen but not yet dealt with. And this is an indication that we need to start a new component. And there's only really one place to go now because I've given myself such a small example. Um, so we pick this vertex and we um, explore. So we make active one of its half edges and the other is on the stack. And then there's only one connection to make here. So these guys have to get connected to one another. And in fact, I've drawn such a small example here that in fact it has both a loop and a pair of and a sort of multiple edge between two vertices but that's sort of a consequence of my having picked a, a situation which has only four vertices okay so i hope 
the way that the exploration process is going is reasonably clear, at least from the example, if not from the description. Okay, so let me just remind you that Rn of i is the number of half edges on the stack at step i, including the one that's active. And so Rn of i is going to be zero if and only if I've just finished exploring a component. And if you think about it, you can see that the number of steps between successive zeros of the process Rn is going to correspond to one plus the number of edges in the component. So there's the, the sort of step at the start where I pick a vertex and then there's at each subsequent step, I create an edge. So as long as numbers of edges in components and numbers of vertices in components are similar, these lengths of excursions above zero of this process Rn is going to be a good way of capturing component sizes. So in order to see the difference between numbers of edges and numbers of vertices, I'm going to want to keep track of an extra piece of information. So this is the counting process Nn of i. So this is just going to count the steps at which an active half edge joins to a half edge on the stack. Okay, so whenever I do that, um, and you can see it in my example back here, you create a cycle. Okay, so these um, surplus edges, as we call them, are the ones which create cycles in the graph. So Nn of i just keeps track of the number of surplus edges that we've observed so far up to step i. And my aim is now to describe the limiting behavior of this pair of processes. So we've got the stack size process, and then this auxiliary process of essentially just marks every time we see a surplus edge. Okay, so I'm going to give you a description of the limit of this under rescaling. So I need a few building blocks in order to describe the process that I'm going to use. So the first of those building blocks is a spectrally positive alpha stable Levy process. So this spectrally positive, I mean, it has only positive jumps. Um, and probably the easiest way to think of this is simply as the scaling limit of a centered random walk with a specific heavy tail step distribution. So I want um, for simplicity to match up with the, the models that I'm doing. Let's think about IID random variables with some probability mass function P, where the mean of that distribution is two and the tail behavior looks like this. So uh, not the tail behavior, sorry, the, the probability mass function behaves like C times I to the minus alpha plus one this time, rather than alpha plus two, as I goes to infinity for constant C and alpha. Okay, so if I take such IID random variables, I'm going to center them by subtracting the mean and sum them up to make a random walk. Then it turns out that if I rescale by n to the minus one on alpha and I scale time by n, then I get convergence and distribution to this Levy process. Okay, so I've taken a sort of specific setup of a generalized central limit theorem, which is kind of one sided in the sense that these things can, that, that their heavy tail is only in the upward direction. Okay. So that gives us the spectrally positive version. So this limit is characterized by a couple of properties. This has Cadillac paths, stationary independent increments, and it has a specific form for the Laplace transform of um, LT. Okay, so there are some constants here depending on alpha. Okay, so that's going to play a key part in our, um, our scaling limit object. So I want to take this process L and I want to reweight its measure. So I want to do a martingale change of measure to this process. So let mt be this exponential of this functional of my Levy process. Okay, so it turns out that this is a mean one martingale. Um, so that takes a little bit of proving, but it can be done. Um, and that means that I can use it as a radon Nikodin derivative. So I'm going to use it as um, the radon Nikodin derivative, which gives me a new measure. So let me do that this way. So in order to sort of characterize or, or fix the distribution of my, my process, my new process L tilde, let me just give you uh, the expectation of some test function uh, integrated so of, the, of the path of this process up until time t. Okay, so I'm just going to define that to be the path of the Levy process measure changed by this Martingale mt. Okay, so that gives me a sort of reweighting, if you like, of the law of the process for a, a compact time interval. So let me show you what this looks like for alpha equals two. This works in exactly the same way there. So if alpha equals two, my Levy process is simply a Brownian motion or in general, a constant times a Brownian motion. 
Okay, so that's going to be kappa is this constant. So it looks something like this. These are lovely pictures that Luigi made. Um, so if I do this Martingale change of measure in this context, this is really actually just the Cameron martin gasanoff theorem. Okay, and the effect of the change of measure is to give my Brownian motion this negative parabolic drift. Okay, so I get a drift which is minus kappa squared t squared on two. Okay. So all I've done is reweight the distribution of the paths of the process on compact time intervals. And so almost sure properties on those compact time intervals are going to be the same. So for example, the, the new process is going to have only positive jumps. However, we have to be a little bit careful. This doesn't pass nicely to the t equals infinity limit. And indeed the long-term behavior, as you can see on this previous slide, these really do behave differently. So the Brownian motion is recurrent. This process with this negative drift is clearly going to be transient. And those two things are also true for the general L tilde case. So I now want to think about this process reflected at its running infema. So just every time it hits its infema, I'm going to give it a kick up so that it stays positive. Okay, so this is uh, the process RT and hopefully named in such a way that it suggests it ought to be the limit of Rn. Okay, I need one extra bit of information. So conditionally on this process RT, let's consider an auxiliary Poisson point process whose intensity is one on mu in the area under the graph of this process R. So remember that mu is simply the mean of my degree distribution. So it's just a constant. Okay, and then let's let nt be the number of points which have occurred by time t. So equivalent, you can think of nt as simply being inhomogeneous Poisson point process whose intensity is given by the size of this process at time t divided by mu. Okay. So given those two pieces of information, the theorem is then that if I rescale my stack size process, so I want to be looking on a time scale of n to the alpha on alpha plus one, and I want to rescale space by n to the minus one on alpha plus one. So let me observe that the relationship between these two quantities is I take this to the power minus one on alpha, right, which is the same rescaling that we saw in the context of the, the random walk converging to the Levy process. So it really is the same rescaling, it's just I'm looking at a slightly unusual time. And then I want to look at my process, which is tracking. So this, remember, is the counting process tracking the arrivals of surplus edges. And that, I just want to rescale the time. I don't need to rescale space. It's an integer valued quantity. And I get convergence and distribution of this pair of random processes to the pair of random processes that I just gave you. So this is my reflected measure changed um, uh, Levy process. And this is its accompanying Poisson process. Okay. So I'm now going to sort of shove a few things under the carpet. <laughs> um, so um, working with these processes requires a, a fair amount of sort of fiddly stochastic analysis, but it can be done. Um, and this implies various things. So it implies that by time step t n to the alpha on alpha plus one, this quantity is a, a, a Poisson process with a finite intensity. So in particular, on a compact time interval, it's only going to have finitely many points. So in particular, I've encountered order one surplus edges by that time step. And that tells me that the lengths of the excursions above zero of my sort of stack size process are going to be a good approximation for the component sizes. I've only seen order one surplus edges. I have the property that if a component is a tree, then its number of edges is its number of vertices minus one. So these are a sort of order one differences and on the other hand, the component sizes themselves are the lengths of excursions above zero of this thing. And because on this time scaling, we're getting a nice sensible limiting process, that tells us that the longest, the largest components are on the order of this time rescaling here. So they're n to the alpha on alpha plus one. And so in particular, if we're careful about it, we can actually deduce the convergence after rescaling of the component sizes to the lengths of these excursions above zero. And then finally, it turns out that the number of components we've explored before time t n to the alpha on alpha plus one is on the order of the displacement of this process. That's not so important here. Okay, so I want to spend um, a little bit of time now just giving you an idea of how, about, how one goes about proving this. So um, I want to first think about the exploration process. Yeah. So yeah, can go I, for it. 
can I ask a question? Of course you can. Um, I, I don't see what happened to the parameter gamma here. Ah, so gamma is nowhere in all of this. <laughs> it's sort of hidden in the fact that we, we've got a mean and, uh, uh, yeah, so it, yes, it, you, you won't feel the gamma in this. Yes. So uh, where is it? It's the fact that um, we're looking at a centered process effectively. So the, the Livy process, which I'm sort of comparing to, is, is a centered object. Um, and that's where the criticality is coming in. Okay, thanks. No problem. So I want to think back to the, the exploration process. So every time we have an active half edge, we pick its pair and it either connects to a, vert a vertex that we've already seen, so it connects to a half edge on the stack, or it connects to a, a half edge which belongs to a vertex we haven't yet explored. And every time we connect to a vertex we haven't yet explored, we're doing so in a size biased manner. Okay. So if I just want to look at the order in which the vertices are, in which we discover new vertices, each time I'm just seeing a size biased random reordering of my degrees. Okay, so if you like, what I could do is I could say, let me first generate the random ordering in which I'm going to see these degrees. And then whenever I pick a new vertex, and that's the one I'm going to give myself. So I can, I can sort of determine this order in advance, in fact. Okay, so I observe the degrees in the random order, which is the size bias random ordering. So in other words, I pick a first degree with probability proportional to its size, so from among all of those available to me. And then I pick the second from among those which are remaining with probability proportional to its size and so on and so forth. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm taking a random permutation of my degrees where that permutation has this distribution conditionally on the degrees. Okay, so let me define a sort of random walk type process. I'm going to start from zero, and I'm going to take the size bias random ordering on my degrees, and I'm just going to sum up the first k of them minus two. So the minus two here is the center. Okay. So this is behaving pretty much exactly like the stack size process, except for a couple of things. So why the minus two? So every time I connect to a vertex, I'm taking one off the stack, the one that was active half edge, and I'm also taking off, taking out of consideration the half edge that it connects to. So that's where the minus two is coming from. And on the other hand, I gain the remaining uh, half edges of the, of the new vertex. Okay, so this is looking very much like the stack size process, except it does the wrong thing at the start of a component. At the start of a component, I just get all of the stubs that belong to a vertex rather than having this minus two thing going on. Um, and whenever I pair the active half edge with a half edge that's on the stack, I don't actually observe a new vertex at all. So on such steps, I'm not actually getting one of these increments, I'm just getting a minus two. Okay. But these are two things which occur relatively infrequently. So typical steps. I'm getting more or less precisely this. I'm getting my next degree in my size bias random order, minus two. And it turns out that neither of these things is really problematic. The first one I can deal with pretty much just by reflection, but it's technically easier to deal with the unreflected process. And two simply just doesn't show up in the limit. It's not something we can see once we've rescaled. So I now want to compare to something that really is a random walk. So this isn't a random walk because these quantities are dependent on one another. You know, I've taken a collection of IOD random degrees, but now I've ordered them in a way that's sort of dependent on their sizes. And so that's generated the sort of dependence between them. On the other hand, I want to now compare to a truly IID situation. So let's take D star one, D star two, and so on to have the true size bias distribution. And let's make the standard random walk out of them. Okay, so these, by assumption, again, this is the criticality condition have me too. Okay, so then this is really just the, the generalized central limit theorem here that we get convergence if we do the correct rescaling. So here again, I've got this slightly unusual time rescaling, but if I take this to the power minus one on alpha, I get this. And so that must be the right rescaling in order to get my Levy limit. And remember that we got L tilde from L by changing measure with this thing. So it turns out there's just a discrete version of that change of measure, which allows us to compare 
my sort of slightly weird, not quite a random walk with this true random walk here. And that discrete change of measure converges as n goes to infinity on rescaling to precisely this martingale here. And it's sufficiently integrable that I can conclude that I get convergence in distribution of my S tilde process to the L tilde process. Okay, and so then I just need to reflect in order to get the limit of the R process. So I want to observe that this makes precise the idea that these degrees in a size biased random order should look similar to IID size biased random variables. It's unfortunate that we use the same term for two different things. Um, one of these is, uh, is just a different distribution related to the first one, and this really is taking the same random variables and reordering them. Okay, so this change of measure is precisely quantifying the asymptotic difference between these two sequences. So if I then reflect at the start of my components, that's going to give me a convergence in distribution to the reflected version of this measure changed living process. And then just a sort of observation about these surplus edges. So remember they're arriving, we've got this counting process, which just counts them as they arise. And on this time rescaling, I'm getting convergence to a possible point process. Why does that happen? Well, essentially the probability of connecting to a half edge on the stack is proportional to the size of the stack. I'm more likely to connect there if I've got more things. Done. But it's quite a rare event. And so it's natural that the limit should be a Poisson process whose intensity is given by some constant times the size of that stack. Okay, so all of this would be simply reproving results of F and Joseph really, if it weren't for the fact that our setup actually carries much more information about the graph than simply component sizes and numbers of surplus edges. So for the next few slides, I'm going to get a little bit less precise. I'm going to sort of give slightly less uh, detail about how these things work, but I hope nonetheless, it will be enough to get an idea of what's going on. So a sort of non-trivial fact is that this stack size process Rn fully encodes a forest of random trees. So one of those trees in the forest is given by each of the excursions above zero of this stack size process Rn. And these trees are actually spanning trees of the components of my underlying graph. Okay. And so in fact, the convergence of this process Rn really entails the convergence of those spanning trees, not just their sizes, but also their structures. So this forest, which is encoded by Rn, is approximately absolutely continuous with respect to a forest of trees which was being coded by this true random walk. So the true random walk S, which had step sizes, which were simply the true size bias distribution minus two. Okay, so let's think for a moment just about what this forest encoded by a proper random walk would be. So that's going to consist of IID Galton Watson trees with a critical offspring distribution, which is in the domain of attraction of stable law. So this um, random walk really is just encoding what happens if I take a sequence of Galton Watson trees without any constraint, which have a critical offspring distribution and um, whose offspring distribution is in the domain of attraction of a stable law. So this is a setting which is very well studied, um, starting from seminal work of Aldous in 1991 in the finite variance case, and then pursued by Duquesne, Le Gall, Le Jean, and many others in the general case. And so let me just give you a sort of um, example theorem, if I can put it like that. So if I take a Galton Watson tree with offspring distribution d star minus one, which I condition to have size n. So let me observe here that the expectation of d star minus one is one. So this is critical offspring distribution, and it's got this heavy tail. So then as n tends to infinity, if I rescale this Galton Watson tree condition to have size n by a factor of n to the minus alpha minus one on alpha, I get convergence in distribution to the so-called alpha stable tree, or in the alpha equals two case, this is the Brownian continuum Mellon tree of Aldous. So if I take a, a sequence of these trees encoded by a whole random walk, what that's giving me is sort of little scaled stable trees. Okay, and we have something which is absolutely continuous with respect to that picture. So let me just say for, for those who know what these things are, so if what's the sense of this convergence? So I think of these trees as metric spaces, again, using the graph distance, and I rescale that graph distance by this factor here. And then convergence is with respect to the so-called Gromov-Hausdorff topology. Okay. 
Okay, so unfortunately, I don't have remotely enough time to go into what that is, but I hope that uh, this is at least giving you an idea of what's going on here. So this is uh, one of Igor Korchemsky's beautiful pictures of um, the Brownian continuum random tree, or maybe the beautiful picture that everybody now uses. Um, here are some maybe less often seen pictures. So this is the alpha stable tree with alpha being 1.5. And again, we're going to see this fact that if we decrease the value of alpha, the behavior gets wilder. You get these bigger and bigger sort of hubs. Okay, so you can see here these vertices of intimate degree sort of popping up as these really dense bits of the picture. Okay, so that's a, those are the alpha stable trees. And these should at least remind you of Delphin's pictures of my graph, except that of course, obviously these are trees and so they don't have cycles. So these stable trees are extremely nice random metric spaces. Let, let me just tell you a few of their properties. So for alpha equals two, the branch points are all binary, whereas if I take alpha between one and two, then in fact, all of the branch points are of infinite degree with probability one. These are very beautiful random fractals with explicit distributional self-similarity. Uh, the alpha stable tree has Hausdorff dimension, which is equal to alpha on alpha minus one almost surely, also for alpha equals two. And you can actually build them by a, what we call line breaking constructions, which uh, involve cutting up R plus into intervals of random lengths and then gluing them to one another. So there's a way of creating each of these alpha stable trees by line breaking. So coming back to my, uh, my graph model, using the absolute continuity, I get that the spanning trees of the components of GN are converging on rescaling not to stable trees, but to measure change stable trees. Okay, so I've got this absolute continuity relation. I'm not quite getting a random walk and in the limit, I'm not quite getting a Libby process, but I'm getting a measure change with respect to those things. And if I additionally track the locations of the surplus edges, which it turns out can be done in a canonical manner, I can actually keep track of the full metric structure. So not just a, uh, an underlying spanning tree, but also how the, the cycles get sort of put on top of it. And if I then think of the components as metric spaces and I rescale the graph distance by n to the minus alpha minus one or alpha plus one, I'm going to obtain a limit, a collection of limit spaces, which are somehow measure change stable trees with extra vertex identifications, somehow encoded by these plus and points which create the cycles. Okay. So here's a quick caricature of what that looks like. So this is uh, an excursion of one of my alpha stable Levy processes. This is the sort of caricature of the tree that corresponds to it. So somehow this, I'm not telling you how to do this and I'm afraid it's rather involved, so I won't have time to explain it, but I hope you'll believe me that there's a relationship between this excursion here and the sort of caricature of tree I've got on the right hand side. And we had these Poisson points landing under the graph of this process and they actually encode vertex identifications in this tree, which put in the cycle structure. And it turns out that with probability one, the vertex identifications are all going to be from leaves into these hubs of infinite degree. Okay, so um, it's probably good if I at least state the theorem. So let's let G1, G2, N and so on be the components Christina, you, you, you muted yourself, I think. I don't think I touched anything, <laughs> but that's fine. Can you still see my screen? Good. Okay, so let's let these be the components of GN or of MN listed in decreasing order of size. I'm going to take the graph distance in each component, and I'm going to also include a counting measure. That turns out to be a useful thing to do on the vertices of my each of these graph components. And then for the limit object, let's let C1, C2 endowed with their distances, and this is going to be a measure for each one of these things. So these are going to be the trees that are encoded by my excursions of R, along with these extra vertex identifications. And then each of those is going to get endowed with, well, the push forward of the Lebesgue measure on the excursion interval onto that object. So I, this will be obscure to those of you who have not come across this idea before, but it turns out to be technically very useful to have these measures around. Okay, so then it turns out that there exists constants A alpha and B alpha, such that if I take these graph components, I rescale the graph distance by n to the minus alpha minus one on alpha plus one, and I rescale the measures by n to the minus alpha on alpha plus one, then I get convergence in distribution of this collection of components as metric spaces with measures to these limiting objects. Okay, so these are encoded 
by the excursions of my limit process R. So this convergence holds in the product gram of Hausdorff topo Prokhorov topology for those who understand what that is. And let me um, note that there's very closely related work by Barmidi and Sen in the, D, the expectation D1 that cubed is finite case, and by Barmidi, Dara, Van der Hoster, and Sen in the heavy tailed case, which I'll come back to in a moment because I want to make a comment about the relationship to other things in the literature. But before I do that, I want to firstly say that we call this limit object the stable graph. So in the alpha equals two case, this would be the scaling limit of the Oedish Renyi random graph. And I think it's sensible to call that the Brownian graph. And so let's call these ones the stable graphs. Um, and here's uh, another set of uh, simulations by Delphin. This is what uh, a limit component looks like. And he's nicely picked out the cycle structure within it. Okay, so you can see they look superficially rather similar to the alpha stable trees. They've got the same property of having these hubs, but here we've also got these um, loops, so cycles within the object. So I just want to quickly give you another description of this object. So suppose I take the ordered sequence of component masses. So those are just the lengths of the excursions of my process R. And I want to also give myself the surpluses of the limit components. So this is are simply the numbers of Poisson points falling in each of these excursion intervals. So as a consequence of our measure change and of the underlying scaling properties of the alpha stable Levy process, it turns out that there's actually a kind of canonical family of continuum graph components indexed by the surplus, such that if I condition on the lengths of my excursions and on the numbers of surplus edges or on the numbers of Poisson points, then actually the ith one of my components is simply distributed as, so the, the si term in this sequence with a sort of slight stretching or, or shrinking of its uh, distances and a rescaling of its measure. And that's independently for different i. So if you give me the excursion lengths of this process and the number of Poisson points falling into each of those excursions, then given that information, the different components are actually independent of one another and are sampled from this sort of canonical family of components. So this decomposition allows us to deduce a wealth of distributional and geometric information about these limiting spaces. And that's what Benedict is going to talk about in her talk in a moment. So I want to leave you with just uh, some comments about related work and an open problem, which I find quite mysterious. So uh, I mentioned just now that there was related work by Bermidi, Dahara, Van der Hostad and Sen. So this is a, a series of papers culminating in two, one of which was uh, published in 2020, another which is, I, I think, still in the process of being uh, reviewed. Um, so they prove a more general scaling limit theorem for the critical configuration model. So they take deterministic degrees rather than these IID degrees that I've taken, um, which satisfy certain slightly complicated to write down conditions. Um, and they obtain a sort of correspondingly more complicated limit object. So they get similar um, scalings, so the, 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 the scalings at N are, are similar to those that we get. And really what should be going on here is that the stable graph should be somehow an annealed version of the limit object that these guys get in their, their more general paper. And thus far, we have been completely unable to find direct proof that if we plug in these random degrees into their limit object, you get the same thing that we do. So I would say that the sort of advantage of the alpha stable graph is because it has this nice underlying self-similarity, which is coming from the alpha stable process, we can say much more detailed information about the properties of the components. And that's what you'll see in a moment in Benedict's talk, but of course, much more general things are out there. And that seems like a good place to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll leave you with the, the references to the papers. Thank you very much, Christina, for this lovely talk. Um, so um, are there any, any questions for Christina? You can either ask them in the chat or unmute yourself to ask it if you want. Um, can I can say hand up. <laughs> yes. So uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Is this sure. uh, 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 scaling limit that you define is uh, as understand correctly for a single component? 
Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Well, uh, whether the scaling limits that you treat here has to do with a single component. Yeah, you have a you have many components, but you, you never look at, at the forest. You look one tree at a time. So uh, this, but we have a sequence of these components. So we look no. at them it, for definiteness. Okay. We think about them in decreasing order of size, but, but that's really but just... You don't, you don't put all of them in one metric space. You don't put yeah. all of them in. So you could, that, that would be one way of going about it. We just put things which are in different components at infinite distance, and we allow ourselves that in our, in our metric. That would be uh, one way of going about this it turned out to be more convenient to think about them as, as sort of distinct objects. But of course they depend on one another through their sizes and indeed. Yeah, but then you will have a, a natural distance between components that you don't, you don't have here. Uh, I guess the different distance between components is simply infinite at that point. Is what? It's simply infinite. Oh, okay. Because if you if you're if you're not connected, then you, you can't have finite distance. Okay, thank you. There is a question in the chat, uh, Christina. I don't ah, know. so I should try and look at the chat. Should I? Um, let me just have a quick look. Mm -hmm. um, the beginning message. What does it mean by it's in the same universality class as critical ER? Um, so what I mean is that up to scaling constants, um, you get exactly the same scaling limit. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are some constants that sort of come in here and there, a little bit like a variance, for example. But what I mean is that if you rescale the critical graph components with the same power of n, then you're going to get the same scaling limit. I hope that sort of explains more or less. I used a centered random walk as a cornerstone of the initial derivations. Is this necessary? Yes, it really is. So um, if I have something which is, so the, the, the fact that it's centered is really this property that we're looking at the critical random graph. And if we're, so if we have the, yeah, so really it happens to me mean equals two because that was the convenient sort of way of looking at things for me. But if I've got a mean which is bigger than that, then I'm going to be looking at a situation where I expect to have a giant component Okay, and things are then on a very different scale. And in particular, that giant component in some sense has less randomness in it than these critical components do, because what you're getting there is a law of large numbers for the size of the, the giant component. So somehow the, the limiting behavior is somehow less rich because um, here we're really getting some randomness in the sizes at once, even once we've rescaled by the sort of dominant scaling. Uh, what happens if alpha is less than or equal to one? Um, things get very exciting. <laughs> um, so you get kind of these condensation effects. Um, so in particular, somehow things don't stay kind of nicely compact. You get um, kind of things exploding basically. So it, it's not really possible in the same way to, to make sense of a, a scaling limit um, like this. Um, so uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, mm. Any work of local limits of the sequence of graph? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the question certainly makes sense. And um, I think it would, I don't know with, I, I guess this has probably been written down somewhere. I'm afraid I don't know what the, the right reference is, but certainly this comparison to a branching process locally really does work. Um, I hope that answers the question. So um, can, I, can I ask something it's still related to this story about the fact that you don't feel gamma? Um, so for the Erdogan, for the Erdogan round graph, you have this whole critical window, right? Yep. And and you vary, um, you vary, you know, there's a parameter lambda, and you vary lambda, and you, this changes the, the the parabolic drift, and you have a whole process actually. Yeah. So is there any chance you think that you? Is there, is there a process somewhere here? And what is the parameter? And... So, so yes, you certainly can do that. Um, so that's actually that's something that my student Sata Dondovenkov has uh, worked on and, and has some very nice results, which is in the process of getting written up about it. Um, the limit objects don't quite have such sort of pleasant properties as these ones. This somehow is, is a rather special setting, which, which has these kind of really nice kind of canonical graphs that sort of sit underneath them, which Benedict will talk about in a moment. Um, but you certainly can make sense of um, the critical window. And indeed, this is something that um, Shankar Bermudian company have, have done in their setting also. Somehow the natural way to think about this is percolation. So you can think about uh, sort of 
doing percolation in order to sort of move you around within the critical window. Okay, thank you. So I think that if there are no more immediate questions, maybe we could just all unmute ourselves and, and thank Christina for the lovely talk. Thank you. And I suggest that we take a, a five minute break and we reconvene at 5.02. Is that right now? Yeah.